Welcome back to the Chess Geek channel. Today, I am super excited to present to you the Makaganov variation with the white pieces. This is a weapon that I've been personally using to play against the King's Indian defense, and it's super unique compared to all of the other options you have as white. Against the King's Indian, generally speaking, black goes for a king side attack with the f5 pawn push and in general black expands on the king side and typically white does so on the queen side with this setup we totally switch that we're going to attack them on the king side and if they insist on also attacking on the king side that generally doesn't work well whatsoever they have to switch their game plan and attack on the queen side. And even then, we have some really cool ideas. So I'm excited to present this to you. And let's begin immediately with the variation. We play h3 here. Now, this setup has been tried by a ton of players. Uh, recently, Caruana has played this a ton. In the past, Karpov was known to play this. In fact, this is sometimes known as the Karpov system. And basically, the system consists of the move h3, and after castles, bishop to e3. h3 is necessary for a few reasons. First of all, the obvious reason is, of course, so the bishop doesn't get harassed here on e3. But the less obvious reason comes into effect when you realize what our game plan is. What we want to do, typically, and, and this is where it gets super unique and creative, we are going to play g4 and we are going to attack them super early on. The knight has less use on f3 when we attack on the king side. We prefer the knight to be on g3. So very often the knight maneuvers to e2, we play g4, the knight goes to g3, and then we continue with our h and g pawns, uh, and eventually the dream position would be getting our rooks onto the g and h file, and sacrificing the knight on f5 or h5, opening the, the position up, the queen teams up with the bishop on this diagonal uh, to harass the other bishop, and we go for a full-on attack on the king side. So that is our dream position and dream idea. Of course, black is going to make this as hard as they can, but typically they can't do much. So let's go ahead and see some more concrete variations. We'll begin with e5. Against e5, we're going to play d5 like we always do, and here, they're going to, for example, play a5. Now, this is what I was talking about. They cannot play their f5 systems. If they try a move like knight to e8 in these sort of positions, they always have to be wary of the g4 move that will immediately come. And you're going to see this uh, a bit later in the video in a slightly different position. But if they insist on f5, you're going to see that it doesn't work well for them because we have such a good grip on that on that square. So they typically will change and not go for f5 and go for a much more effective assault on the queen side. And this often means playing a5 and trying to get the knight, uh, one of the knights, to c5 without us having the ability to play b4. That's why a5 is so necessary early on. So we continue with g4, our game plan. They play knight a6, we go knight, again, this is important, knight g to e2, not to f3, because we want... Uh, the knight to help in the attack, and it is far more helpful on g3. And now let's say they move knight d7. Where does the queen go? As I mentioned earlier, the queen is on d2. This is the most active square for the queen. We want to get bishop to h6 like you do in so many other openings and so many other variations. And here, we'll look at the more critical variations, which is when they continue their attack on the queen side. This is the one that you have to be a bit more um, alert uh, when they play like this, but just to quickly um, uh, show you why f5 is just impossible, if they insist on playing on the king side, this won't work. We're going to take, they're going to take, we take. Here, they're probably going to uh, wait a little with taking because they don't want the knight to attack the rook. So, for example, let's say they go knight to c5. Uh, now we can go knight g3. Let's say now they take Anyways, the rook lands here. Now, if the knights are not on b4 and not on c5, making the d3 square accessible for our bishop, we're going to place our bishop here, attack the rook, attack the pawn behind it. Uh, if they ever later, once the bishop is already here, attack that bishop, the bishop can tuck away 
maintaining eyes on this long and fruitful diagonal. In this case, that's not really possible, but fear not, the rook is not stable anyways, and at some point we can attack it either with the queen, uh, or if they let us with the bishop, you'll see some techniques to do so. So we can castle long. Very often that's what we're going to do in this position. Let's say knight before we can go queen e2, queen e7, and for example, we can take. And there's multiple uh, playing philosophies here that you can kind of juggle around, play with. There's a lot of flexible systems. For example, one appealing option is to run the pawn down and maybe play bishop h6, try to get rid of this bishop, right? So for that, you'd want to keep your bishop here. But I want to show you a more positional way to play this as well, which is less going for a tactical uh, setup with the bishop, but we're going to trade off the bishop and then grab control of the square. So we play a3, kick away the knight, and then we can go knight e4. And the knight is such a monster here, defending the square so the rooks are not doing anything. And here, for example, h4. And this is not even less tactical because this is just as crushing. The bishop is coming to h3 and then to e6, uh, where it's going to be incredibly active. The queen is going to come in uh, either through g4 or h5. The rooks are going to land on the g and h file. And we're the only ones having fun here with the, the centralized knight, which is super powerful. So all of that is to say that f5 is not an effective way for them to play. And they're much better off playing immediately on the queen side, leaving the king side as closed as they can, not touching it for the moment. So we go knight g3, they go c6. This is their best option. Uh, they want to open up the position. So when we castle, we are going to have uh, more, more issues with our king. We're going to continue by playing bishop e2, developing our bishop. You can also consider bishop d3 in some cases. Sometimes you have to worry about the tempo of the queen being misplaced and then having to come back. Sometimes you have to worry about the bishop um, being taken here and, and just won if the two knights are teaming up. So bishop e2 is super uh, fine as well, just keeping the bishop on a square where it's also defending this pawn so you can continue with h4 immediately without having to go for the first for f3. So now let's say they play c takes on d5. Here, there's a few ways to play. In some cases, you can get away with this, which is a, a bit greedy, a bit too ambitious, I find sometimes. Your idea is to keep the queen side as locked down as possible so you can castle here more safely uh, and still kind of reap the rewards of the attack on the king side. But we're playing a little on both sides. It's nice to have the pawn majority over here, so we're dragging away forces a little bit, giving them the ability to also open up their bishop. It, typically, I find that this is a little too ambitious, so for this reason, I like taking with the c-pawn. This does mean that castling queenside is a little less likely. There's cases where you can safely castle and then tuck your king on b1, and, you know, with that, get both rooks in, into the game, but typically, the method to get your king safe and your rooks involved is rather unique. You're going to, uh, at some point, first launch your pawns, obviously. This is the whole point of the attack. We want to make progress here, continuing with h5. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to tuck away the king on g2, where the rooks are going to connect. So a3, we play b3, queen a5, rook to c1 to match the rook, but ultimately, as I said, king on g2. Now, why is the king safe here? Typically, if your king is on the king side, you don't want to launch your pawns there because your king becomes weak. But what we've done here is hinted the entire beginning of the game that we're going to castle long because we've been playing so aggressively on the king side. So black has maneuvered all their pieces to the queen side. And now we're totally switching it up and we're actually maneuvering the king over to the queen side, uh, to the king side rather. So our king is fully safe here. And it also doesn't really disrupt the attack. The rooks are connected and they can just as easily and effectively stack on the h file. So the king is perfect here. It's, it's safe and uh, it's not getting in, in the way of any attack. Uh, they continue, let's say, knight b4, we take, they take, we're actually following a game here, you can see the bishop getting active, and then you can see the other rook coming in, um, unfortunately, so I should mention, this was the game, Caruana with the white pieces against Hikaru with the black ones, it was played in 2018, and here, unfortunately, Caruana made a critical mistake, queen to c1, too passive, um, and this actually allowed black to seize back the control in the position and eventually go on to win, but white was crushing. I mean, 
the pressure on the h file, the safe king, and the uh, and you'll see this the uh, ability and um, purpose of this knight when it comes to f5 and h5 is going to be highlighted. And so what white should have done is gone g5 here, trying to further expose the position. And let's say they take the knight f5. And we're threatening to take here. They more or less have to take, but now we take back and this pawn is super strong. And, you know, their best move, for example, is in this case knight d to b3, but now we push further. Uh, and we want them to take because then we have a crushing attack just with our major pieces in this case, although very often our knights and bishops are also really powerful. And here it's simply, uh, you know, checkmating. I mean, if they take, it's just made in one. Otherwise, they're losing the rook. It's, it's totally game over. And so just like that, white could have won the game. So you see how fun this uh, opening really is. You get really aggressive uh, positions and they're objectively good, but also practically a King's Indian player doesn't want to play a tactical game against them. They don't want to be attacked on the King side. They want you to attack on the Queen side when all they have is pawns. And in the meantime, they're going to kill you on the King side next to your King. So we're totally switching up the game plan. It shocks them uh, and, and, you know, I encourage you, if you play this against, you know, over the board against a real live player, afterwards, ask them, you know, in their King's Indian experience, what did they think of this opening? Have they faced it before? You know, did they find it challenging or annoying to play? Because at least what I've found out is that this is a, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's the bane of their existence. So they really hate uh, playing against this sort of setup. And of course, it's objectively, as I said, good as well. But I should emphasize, as fun as attacking aggressively with g4 and then the pawns rushing up and the knight coming to g3, as fun as that is, it can't always be uh, the way that you win. And so what do I mean by that? Well, against c5 systems, uh, we go d5. Let's say they go uh, and develop their knight. We develop our bishop and they go a6. You have to recognize when it's appropriate to go for the attack and when it's not. Now here, the reason it's not appropriate is because the attack that black is doing here by playing c5 and later b5, they're going to have much more pawns uh, pushing forward on the queen side. Black is playing in a more aggressive way. And if you try to play knight to e2 and then g4 and playing in that system, it's not going to end up working well for you. And I'll show you, you know, exactly why it doesn't work. But just to show you the quick and easy, simple solution to this, you be flexible. You don't, I mean, h3 is a great standalone move. It doesn't mean you have to play g4. You haven't committed at all. The, the bishop can't come here now, right? h3 is a, a totally good positional move on its own. Bishop e3, same thing. It's not like we've committed to the attack. So here, very simple, knight f3 right? If, if their attack seems to be so aggressive and impossible to defend against, or if you just have a bad feeling about it, knight f3 solves all your problems. And you enter in a, to, into a position where you castle short and you're playing totally, uh, you know, a normal position. You have a big uh, expansion on the center. Your knight will find great squares over here on g3 f3. Your king is as safe as it can be. Both your bishops are um, are in the game and at some point uh, both could become active as well and their attack on the queen side will cease to exist. I mean you could even combat something like a5 with the immediate a3 and just open things up and stop their attack here once and for all and so that's totally legitimate and often the best uh, way to play because if you insist in this position I'll just show this to play in the the system that I've kind of shown what you're going to see is for example, here, because they haven't played e5, and this is a good telltale sign, they haven't played e5, the knight can come here where it's super powerful. Uh, you know, for example, queen d2, oop, you lose your queen, right? Uh, so you have to go f4 here, but now uh, it's already difficult. Bishop to d7, you lose your knight already, you have to sacrifice it here because if you defend it, there's going to be some issues on this diagonal, as you see, for example, knight takes e4. So you're getting destroyed, and the sign for this 
A, I find that C5 systems typically lead to this, but not always. And, you know, you can do workarounds. And if they play this badly, you can definitely still get a, a good aggressive attacking game on the king side. But typically C5 systems, when they have access to E5, the knight here just stops a lot of the um, ideas and ways that we play. Because of the G4 pawn move, this F3 square becomes uh, extremely weak. And we cannot let them whatsoever occupy that so you have to play cautiously and precisely and flexibly that that's the key don't always go and resort to this attacking uh, concept because you might just get checkmated much more quickly than you checkmate them so play this with an abundance of caution if they play e5 normal setups the most common variations you know that we have so many fun ideas g4 Knight e2, knight g3, bishop h6, h4, h5. Uh, the, this bishop can come in as well. Ultimately, the rooks are coming in, and it's it's game on. And then if they play a bit more aggressively and perhaps controlling the center squares and stopping our attacks, then we just transition to a much more calm approach uh, where we have a space advantage in the center, no worries on the queen side, and we are totally good. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you enjoy and can make good of this opening. Truly, it served me well, uh, and hopefully it will serve you as well. Like this video if you learned something new from it. Subscribe if you're new around here and want more content just like this. Check out my chess website where you can see all the cool masterclass projects that I'm working on, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.